Hello, and welcome to a special episode of A Million Other Choices. I am, as always, your host, Kim. I want to be the one to say that I found you safe and held you in my arms. I want anyone else in the world to tell me that they did too. Cross the field to your door and said, hey, baby, it's cool. I was very honored to have Cindy Hall reach out to me and ask me to cover her dear friend's case. I was even more honored to learn that she's a listener of the podcast and choosy about which podcast she asks for coverage from. Um, I really don't blame you, Cindy. I think that there's good ones and not so good ones when it comes to understanding the victim's family's feelings. So her trusting me to tell her friend's story fairly and accurately means a lot to me. I think that knowing someone that you love met with a violent end, but you can't find them is probably one of the most painful and torturous things that the human spirit can endure. As a listener, if you think you get frustrated by cold cases, imagine the pain of that for family and friends. This is the murder of Lisa Marie Young. Across the sea and to your door Take you home But I'm so scared That home isn't here anymore Take you home you This year will mark the 21st year that Lisa Young has been missing. Laura Palmer of Island Crime has an award-winning podcast and her entire season one is dedicated to Lisa's case. For more extensive coverage, I really encourage you to listen to that podcast. To date, her podcast is the most exhaustive and factual cover on Lisa's murder, so I'm going to be relying on her coverage for details that have been verified. As you know, I don't do many cold cases. I am by no means an expert on investigations, and I know that Cindy and her family are not relying on me to solve this case for them. But the reason it is so important to be covered is for a couple of reasons. Number one, this case is solvable. There is still time for justice. A number of the important players are still alive and advancements in technology are making more and more cold cases that were long forgotten and given up on solvable. Number two, someone or more than one person know more about what happened to Lisa Young. Coverage and podcasts and extensive coverage put pressure on those people and those around them to come forward with what they know. And lastly, if at the very least, Lisa's story gets into the ears of a few more people that didn't know about how lovely and vivacious and sweet and caring this woman was, and what a loss to her friends and family her disappearance has been, then it will not be for nothing. Cold cases are solved by advancements in the technology and changes in relationships. Lisa's remains need to be found, and those who have information need to come forward. And with that, let me tell you about what I know about Lisa's murder. Lisa Marie Young came bouncing into this world, an absolute spark of life, on May 5th, 1981. But first, we need to go back and talk about the family that Lisa was born into. Lisa's parents were Don Young and Marlene Joanne Martin, who always went by her middle name, Joanne. Joanne's father, Moses, was the tribal chief of the Toloquiat First Nation. Both of Lisa's maternal grandparents, Moses and Cecilia, were residential school survivors, and Joanne had been unlucky enough to have attended one as well. Joanne stayed very close with her family, but she moved into the city of Nanaimo, which is where she met Don Young. Joanne is unfortunately no longer alive, which I'm going to get to a bit later. But according to Don, who was interviewed by Laura Palmer, she didn't talk a lot about her Aboriginal roots. So Lisa was raised knowing her grandparents and her heritage, but living more of an urban life. And she had two younger brothers with whom she was particularly close, Brian and Robin, who was known as Robbie. Nanaimo is a city of about 100,000 people on the east side of Vancouver Island. Being on the coast, the climate is mild with rainy winters and warm, dry summers. It was also home to singer-songwriter and pianist Alison Crow, who was a good friend of Lisa's. And I'm going to talk about Alison a little bit more at the end of this episode. You heard a bit of her beautiful music at the intro to this episode. And I definitely want to thank her for giving me permission to use it. 
And just a couple of things to note for those of you that are maybe listening from outside of Canada. The legal drinking age in Canada is generally lower than in the U.S. and varies from province to province. In B.C., where Lisa lived, the age is 19. I also really need you to cast yourself back to when you were around the age of 21. You were maybe going to school, partying on the weekends, and just generally having a great time and not really worried about much. And when I say partying, I don't mean like a rock star. At 21, every person that likes to party and have a great time is your friend, especially if you're outgoing and very social. I was not, but I was also very trusting of those around me that were funny, charming, and good-looking. Anyone who is good-looking and charming couldn't possibly be out to harm me. At least you think that at 21 sometimes. Lisa was a bright and hardworking soul. She had goals and aspirations and excelled at sports and just about anything that she put her mind to. She is remembered as as a good and loyal friend, funny and hard-headed. Her father used the term feisty, and that pretty much sums up Lisa. Her good friend Dallas said of her, quote, She was somebody you noticed right away at a party or a gathering or whatever it was. She just had a light about her. She was also socially conscious at an early age becoming a vegetarian. Approaching the Canada Day long weekend in 2002, which we celebrate here on the 1st of July, Lisa was preparing for a move from her Barron's Road apartment, which she shared with a roommate, into her own apartment. Her and her roommate had been living very close to Lisa's parents, so she was excited to be venturing a bit more out on her own. She was going to be starting a new job after the long weekend at a call center and was eager to start saving some money for school. She had aspirations of becoming a sports broadcaster. So she had a pretty busy long weekend planned. The Monday that year was the holiday, so on that day her parents had planned to help her do the moving. But on the Sunday night, she had a birthday party at the Jungle Nightclub for her friend Dallas Hooley. Being 21, if you remember, you can easily party into the wee hours and still get up to go to class or move furniture. So although Don and Joanne kind of rolled their eyes when she left their place at 11 p.m. to start her night, Lisa, like many with all the energy in the world to spare, was just getting her night started. Dallas Hooley is also unfortunately no longer alive. He was killed as a pedestrian when struck by a car on March 25, 2018, in an incident that was not related to Lisa's disappearance. So we're not able to speak with him any further, um, but he was cooperative with the investigation at the time. But we actually do know quite a bit about Lisa's movements on the night of June 30th and into the early early hours of July 1st, 2002. And a lot of this is based on Laura Palmer's hard work investigating this case because, remember, the police don't put out a lot of information, which is good in some ways because they don't want to spook anyone with information about what they know, like a suspect. Uh, Too much information in the public can actually hinder an investigation, but it can be very frustrating for families and friends that really need answers. But we know that Lisa arrived at the Jungle Nightclub that evening. Uh, Dallas was there as well as some other friends that she knew. Dallas and Lisa were friends, and based on what one of Dallas's friends, Jason Goodman, told Laura, he was pretty flirty with her and seemed interested in moving past friendship, but he wasn't pushy about it. They were just kind of flirty with each other. Jason wasn't at the nightclub, but based on other witnesses and Dallas himself back at the time, they were at the nightclub and having a good time. There was no arguments or drama, just good fun. Bars around here close at 2.30, so last call for drinks is around 2 a.m. So around this time, they came out of the bar where there was a number of people gathering. Some were arranging rides home, and others are discussing where to kind of move the party to. And while discussing that, Lisa and Dallas and her other friends were actually interested in going to a house party. At this point, a 27-year-old man who was described as attractive and friendly approached the group of them and they started talking. This man was kind of flirting a little bit with Lisa, but again, not pushy about it. Um, He said that he could drive them to the house party that they were talking about. And the man was driving a red-colored, some described as more burgundy, older model Jaguar. Now, I will say this, the man wasn't trying to conceal anything about himself. It wasn't a stolen vehicle. He wasn't trying to hide his face from anyone or get them to all move really quickly into the car before anyone saw anything. And there are no reports that he gave anyone a fake name that night. And the ride was offered to more than just Lisa. So Lisa was not alone with him in the car when they agreed to get that ride with him, despite him being a stranger to all of them. Remember, when you're 21, he's attractive and friendly. You don't think stranger danger at that age unless there's something unappealing about someone. 
It's not until you get a bit older, usually, that you become suspicious of charming people. According to Jason, they arrived at a place in Har in the Harwood area, and that's where Jason was. He noted their arrival, and he was surprised to see Lisa and Dallas together because he didn't know that they knew each other that well. But he could tell the way you just kind of can that they were flirting with each other and that Dallas was interested in her. The guy that drove them there that they had met at the club, which we're going to call JD for Jag Driver, he was described by Jason as looking well-dressed and friendly and nothing out of the ordinary about him. He seemed to be a little bit more sober than anybody else was. He wasn't being a disruption or argumentative with anyone. He was just there. He made proper eye contact, wasn't shady, nothing of the sort. Harwood is near the university on the westerly part of the city. That is, if my Google Map skills are correct. Later, after hanging out there for a bit, they all decided to go to their friend Wade's place. And Wade's place is a cool place to hang out. He had a hot tub, pool table, that kind of thing. So they leave in two vehicles. There's Dallas, Lisa, Jason, another friend named Ryan, and Wade. And this JD, or drag driver. Now, Jason doesn't really say why JD was tag still tagging along with them. He was um, the more sober of the bunch, so maybe he was just one of the ones that could drive. What's interesting about that is that if Dallas was really interested in Lisa, you'd think that he would say something like, nah, man, we're good, and figure out a different way to get there. I mean, this JD guy was described as attractive. You don't really need com competition, and by the sounds of it, it's not like JD was their buddy or the type that they would choose as a buddy. I don't think they even thought to get the guy's name. But when you're young and having some drinks, everyone is your buddy. And maybe Dallas wasn't as interested in Lisa as um, Jason thought he was. I mean, flirty might just be the nature of their interactions. I think that that happens sometimes. So regardless of why he's still hanging around, he drove them to the Cather's Lake area to Wade's place. Cather's Lake is north of Harwood on the other side of the university from Harwood. Everyone arrives at Wade's place safe and sound and they're just hanging out. All is really good. And they start at the barbecue and Lisa's like, guys, I'm a vegetarian and she wanted Subway. So JD says, I'll take you to the Subway. And there is in fact a Subway near Wade's place. A little bit later, either Dallas calls Lisa's cell or she calls him. Um, they can't really remember which way it went. Now, this is again, according to Jason, who overheard most of the conversation and cooperates with what Dallas's account was before his passing. She said that she was at the subway, so they did make it to subway. But she says that JD wants to go to this other house party and she just wanted to come back to Wade's. She said something to the effect of, I'll figure it out. Um, she didn't sound afraid, but she did sound pissed off, like she's a annoyed at this point with JD. Around 4.30 a.m., she phones Dallas, and according to Dallas's account, she says, quote, Dallas, I don't know what's going on. This guy won't bring me back. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road, and he won't bring me back. I'm bored, and I'm getting pissed off, end quote. So at this point, she's not sounding panicked per se, but she's really pissed off and sounding a little bit more concerned. Um, kind of like she's a little weirded out. She's not sure what's going on. So what has been inferred from this is that he did in fact take her to the subway um, and then to another house on Bowen Road and that they were in the driveway at that point. So probably still sitting in the car together. Either the two of them together or JD alone had exited the car and went into the house, leaving her in the car. She's very pissed off at this point. And then her final text a bit later says, come get me. They won't let me leave. All the reports I was able to find said that she said they, not he. So that tells me that there was more than just JD her, with her at this point. So either she went into the house or someone else came out of the house to where she was. She still has her phone on her and is able to send this text coherently. It's not jumbled and looking like it was sent really quickly in a panic. So she's starting to get concerned and thinking things are weird and she wants out of the situation, but she's not being physically restrained at this point, which can be inferred by the fact that she's able to use her phone. I believe that very shortly after this, her phone would have been taken away from her or she was made incapacitated in some way that she couldn't use it because Dallas texts her back just after her final text that they had all had too much to drink and told her that she should just leave, walk or take a cab or something. Nothing about JD had said to them that he was dangerous or that anything terrible was going to happen. To them, JD was just being a bit of a dick and wanted to party and she was done with it. 
There are zero, as in no reports that Lisa was excessively inebriated that night. She might have been tipsy, but she was pretty much coherent. The next morning, so this is going to be the Monday, Dawn and Joanne um, go over to Lisa's new apartment to help her move, but she's not there. They tried calling her, no answer, and they knew that she had been out the night before, so they figured maybe she's sleeping at a friend's place or she's busy or something. But when her former roommate from her old place stopped by to ask if they had heard from her, they knew immediately that something wasn't right, like at all. Lisa was very excited about this move. She would have been there. They located Lisa's personal phone book and called every single contact. No one had heard from her. So they did what any panicked parents would and contacted the RCMP at 1130 on Monday, July 1st. So seven hours after her long, last contact with anyone only to be told to wait 48 hours, which is actually not a thing in BC. There is no waiting period. But as soon as they heard that her age and that she had been out at a house party, they suddenly weren't that concerned. At least that's the way it appears to me. Um, but her parents, Don and Joanne, knew that there was a problem. So, and they did send someone out that evening to ask a few questions and get a picture of her. Um, there is a lot of talk that because Lisa was part Indigenous that the delay in searching or investigating was racially based. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Yes, I think based on the history of relations between RCMP and Indigenous families of missing murdered Indigenous women and girls in the area. But I think another part of the problem was that missing persons of young adults in general aren't handled particularly well whenever the last known whereabouts whereabouts involves alcohol or drugs which is kind of silly actually considering that those two factors can actually make victimization or at least a bad outcome more likely but anyways the debate on that continues now remember lisa was moving that day she had paid a security deposit and was starting a new job suicide is out of the question and running away very unlikely when she didn't arrive to start her new job on july 2nd so the Tuesday, Joanne called the officer that had taken the picture of her, only to be told that he was off until the 5th and she'd have to wait. Well, this didn't sit very well with Joanne, so she was persistent and managed to get another different officer assigned to her case on July 3rd, so the Wednesday. On July 6th, RCMP Constable Jack Eubank said that there was no evidence that she had met with foul play but then also told reporters that they had a tip that she had been seen as a passenger in a dark vehicle. By July 9th, they had assigned five officers from the Serious Crimes Unit, and by the 10th, they announced that they had reason to believe that she had met with foul play. So what changed between the 3rd of July and the 10th? Well, for one, they tracked down J.D. Actually, let me correct that. They didn't actually do the tracking down. Joanne did. She was frustrated that the RCMP weren't taking it seriously, and she knew that something was very, very wrong. So her and Dawn and friends and other family were doing a lot of investigative work from the minute she hadn't been heard from to find Lisa. And by talking to her friends, it wasn't hard to get the story that she was last seen with this JD guy, a bright colored jag in a city where a lot of folks don't have a ton of money. I think that's not hard to find. Now, here's the thing about JD. His name is out there in the public. You can listen to Island Crime, which I strongly suggest that you do, or read a number of articles that will give you his full name. That information was released a number of years ago, and I know that the family and Lisa's friends really want that information to be put out there to put pressure on him and anyone that knows him to come forward with what they know. But I'm not going to say his name. Um, I'm just not comfortable with giving out the name of someone that hasn't been charged or convicted with anything, but also someone that hasn't been cleared. Um, like I know in the Lindsay Buziak case, I gave the names of Shirley and Jeff as theories, um, but I tried to make it very clear that they had both been cleared by the police of any wrongdoing. In that case, I'm just clearing up some speculation. RCMP have never cleared J.D., now, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I don't think that any privacy or slander laws have been breached by his name being out there. No one has said that JD is the killer of Lisa. It is just factual information that he was the last person that Lisa was known to have been with. 
but I believe that he is at the very least a material witness and has information that could lead to some justice on Lisa's murder. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that initially my feeling was that his name being out there maybe hindered the investigation. As a family member of a victim of violent crime, I totally understand the frustration with being withheld information pertaining to the investigation of your person's murder. Um, but I've also seen the importance of it, and I really believe in it uh, in regards to serious crime investigations. If you look at it from a suspect's point of view, the more you know about what the police know, the more that you can be two, one or two steps ahead of them. So keeping facts close to your chest is really key in investigations. I want justice for Lisa, and I want her body found and the person that killed her found and convicted. The conviction part is the tricky part. It's often easy to get an idea of who might have killed someone. It's another thing to get the evidence to convict on it. But having said that, talking to Cindy, I'm starting to see things more from the family's point of view on this. From the very beginning, if they had left it to the RCMP, there might not have been any searches and investigation to speak of at all. So I get that they're not going to just sit around and wait for the RCMP to tell them something or to do something about it. And to be honest, by not taking it seriously from the very beginning, if Joanna, Don, and everyone had just gone back home and waited it out, wondering and just trusting the RCMP, I don't think they would have ever tried to track down JD. And the reason that this information was so important is that it completely changed the narrative of the story. They immediately went from there's no foul play to this is a homicide and it's being treated like one. Why? Because something about JD was key to that. And again, not that he's necessarily the killer, but something about maybe his background or what he said moved the investigation in that direction. And that direction is the one that current serious crime detectives are still working in. So did his name being released hinder the investigation? No, because there wasn't any investigation to hinder at that point. Did JD flee the area because of his name being in the public? Maybe. But again, you have to ask yourself why. My mom was one of the last people to see Taylor alive. Her name is out there in news reports. She didn't go anywhere. Dallas was the last person to speak to Lisa. He didn't go anywhere. So with all that said, let's talk a little bit more about JD and the facts around him. He was located at a house in Qualicum Beach. The jag belonged to his grandmother. He was brought in and to be questioned. At this interview, he stated that he, she had exited the vehicle and he drove away watching her walk in the opposite way in the rearview mirror, which is interesting because Lisa said that she, he was refusing to leave, but he did leave, but not with her. The RCMP used a technique to try and get an emotional appeal to him to give up a little bit more information by bringing in Joanne, who's Lisa's mom, to the interview to ask him where she was. She, when she came in, she noticed there was a whiteboard with a photo of Lisa and the words rape, murder, accident written on it. His words to her were, quote, I can't, then a pause. And then he said, I don't mean to disrespect your family. According to Don, he was asked to remove his shirt and did not do so. They were also unable to get a warrant to search for DNA under his nails or to check for physical fibers, not without more information to go on. The JAG was searched and swabbed for DNA and an ultraviolet light was used, but by the time the search was done, the vehicle had been steam cleaned. The first 48 to 72 hours in a missing persons case is the most critical, so I think that evidence was likely missed. Remember, this was 10 days after she was reported missing. And once the RCMP were aware of the JAG, it was pretty distinct and in a small town, it was easy to track it down. So I feel that some very important time lapsed here. JD fully admitted that Lisa had been in his vehicle and corroborates the information given by everyone up to the point where she made that last text. JD was released without charges because there wasn't enough evidence. Searches for Lisa and the investigation went on. A number of searches have been done by the family themselves who have taken on an investigatory role in Lisa's murder, just trying to get some answers. I think that Lisa has the most badass crew of warriors behind her that I have ever seen in a missing persons case. It's really something inspiring and amazing to witness. Also a known fact about JD is his criminal history. At the time of Lisa's disappearance in 2002, JD had a few charges under his belt, most of them for fraud. He was known to the police already as a con artist. 
there was a conviction for choking to overcome resistance, assault on a police officer, and a couple of break and enters. His sentences to that date were pretty light. Crimes and convictions are public records, so this is not opinion, it's fact. After Lisa's disappearance, J.D. moved out to Alberta for a time. Constable Brian Rutherford of the Edmonton Police Service was interviewed by Laura for Island Crime and remembers at least one of his dealings with him in 2009. He was a rookie at the time and the call was a domestic disturbance. The victim was in her early 20s. Her and J.D. had been in a relationship for about six months. They fought over money quite a bit and after she had to assume his car payments, she wanted him to sign a tenancy agreement and start paying rent. Things got physical and she fled after being injured in the stomach area. The police escorted the victim back home and did a sweep of the house discovering that he had stolen the cash from her wallet and was found hiding in the basement in a pile of black garbage bags. He was sentenced to 90 days to be served on weekends. By this point, he had already had a few other arrests in Alberta to add to the BC convictions. Several of the charges were laid by women for assault, attempted sexual assault involving a weapon. As I've said about cold cases in the past, because of the holdback evidence police keep out of the public, in-depth media coverage is opinions. The interviews that they get are opinions of those that might be witnesses in court at some point, and I don't normally like to talk about opinions. If you want to hear them, you can listen in detail, and I would certainly encourage you to listen to season one of Island Crime. I think that Laura Palmer has done a great job of vetting the people she's interviewed as credible, but I think it would be fair to say that those willing to speak out don't have a great opinion of the young man J.D. was, or at least who he was at the time. So if you want to hear some of those interviews, that would be episodes 10 and 11 of that series. Also, some things of note about the investigation over the years. John had posters printed within days of Lisa's disappearance and plastered everywhere they could think of around the island. Lisa's grandfather, Moses, organized the tribal search and rescue into a massive search in several different locations and the family was able to track down Lisa's bank and cell phone records. The money was still in her account, but there had been no further activity past the June 30th, and the last and final signal from her phone was in the departure Bay area of Nanaimo, which I believe is about four kilometers east of Bowen Road, and it's also a body of water. The owner of the Jungle Nightclub made a large donation to the search efforts. In June of 2021, Marcus Muttonier, who's now the lead investigator on the case, came out publicly that new information had led them to a number of new search locations and some new information was coming to light about the case. Obviously, he can't and shouldn't say much else about it, but ground penetrating radar and new technology is being used to help in most of these recent searches. Lisa's family and friends continue to participate in searches wherever they can, Finding Lisa's remains at this point is very important, not just to the investigation, but to the family. A $50,000 reward has been put up by a former friend of JD's for Lisa's remains. And you can make of that little tidbit what you will. I have reached out to Marcus Montanier just to ask him a couple questions about what he can say about the investigation. But I haven't heard back from him at the time of this recording, and I don't believe he's going to be able to add much more than he's already said to Laura Palmer, Palmer in her coverage. What I can tell you by the interviews that Laura has done, this case has become very personal to the RCMP in Nanaimo, and I, they want Lisa's case closed and her remains found for her family. Lisa was everyone and anyone's daughter, and the pain of her disappearance has been felt by many, many people in the area, including RCMP investigators working her case in the last few years. Now let's talk about Crime Stoppers. This was very interesting for me to learn. Everyone knows Crime Stoppers, phone and anonymous tips, help solve crimes. Well, a recent court case kind of put a stop to that. This case law protects the identity of informants, meaning that they remain anonymous, which is great for Crime Stoppers, terrible for solving crimes and getting convictions. The RCMP cannot force or compel a Crime Stoppers tipster from testifying or giving any evidence. So when you call Crime Stoppers with a tip and you don't want to give your name, you are essentially just telling the air. Crime Stoppers can give the information to the police, but there isn't much that they can do with it. If you're a witness to a crime, you have to testify at some point for a conviction, and if you are anonymous, you can't testify. So if you have information about this case, please contact Marcus Montanier directly or the RCMP or the police. 
not Crime Stoppers. And please be willing to give your name. If you aren't Lisa's killer, you have nothing to fear. So now on to some theories. Full disclaimer, these are mostly my theories, not Reddit theories. Either JD got angry with her and killed her, they were alone at the time, and he took off, dumped her body somewhere, or someone from inside the house killed her, or someone's, or someone's, because I don't know how many they infer, it could be two, it could be 20, or she could have been drugged or given drugs and overdosed and died accidentally, or she did take off walking and she was hit by a car, eaten by a bear, or killed by somebody else, randomly, but with very good timing. The drugs thing could be a good solution to the mystery if Lisa was known to be a drug user, which she wasn't. Date rape drugs, though, is a possibility, but that would probably have to have been administered by giving her a drink, and it didn't sound like Lisa was much into being social with those people at the time. We are pretty sure that she wasn't hit by a car or eaten by a bear. Even if she had been hit and the driver had moved her body, hit and runs leave tracks and they leave stains. Also, I think if she took off on her own accord, she would have been steaming mad and more likely storming off, and she would have texted Dallas back and told him what a prick that he was being and that she was now walking, and she would have probably given them a piece of her mind for not coming to get her. Now, she didn't do that, and there's no records of her calling or taking a cab. Ubers weren't around back then. And remember, Lisa was described as feisty and hard-headed, so she would have been a fighter. And that leads me to my most probable theory, which I think most of the evidence kind of points to. Lisa would have resisted any physical grabbing of her. So if someone laid a hand on her or touched her, especially in any sexual way, under the circumstances with the mindset that she was in at the time, she likely would have smacked the guy or something like telling him to fuck right off. And some guys don't take rejection very well and can get violent. So my best guess is someone made a move, she fought, and she wound up dying in the fight. If I had to put bets on it, I'd say she was manually strangled. I think her body was then dumped possibly in water, maybe in a wooded area. And I believe very strongly that more than one person witnessed and knows exactly what happened to Lisa. Now, there is a theory um, that's out there that there's a snuff film made of Lisa's killing. And I would have chalked that up to kind of the stuff of urban legends. Filming murder for financial gain has actually never been proven. Um, There are, of course, videos captured by murderers, Lucas Magnata being an example of that. And of course, there's war crimes documented. But an actual industry that makes money off of it as a form of pornography was kind of a myth that started in the 1970s. But in episode 11, Mark Chris Montanier, who, as you know, is the current lead investigator on the case, says something very interesting. He says, quote, there is a tape that's out there that is related to this investigation. You know, this is a way for me to confirm we don't have a copy of that. We don't have that tape. If someone out there does have that, then it would be helpful if it was turned over to us. I find that very interesting. There is also a hair sample that Marcus can't make any comment on. Now, I don't know, that could just be rumor, but hopefully we are getting close on Lisa's case to some resolution for her family and friends. There are some other theories out there over the years, Hell's Angels, human trafficking, other suspects. Most of them have been debunked by the RCMP. Lots of conjecture and rumors, all kinds of I knew a guy who knew a guy kind of stuff. The bottom line is someone killed her and someone knows who killed her and where she is. Every year since Lisa's disappearance, Lisa's friends and family have gathered on June 30th for the walk for Lisa. They start at the Nanaimo RCMP detachment office and move through the streets of downtown. Joanne Young, she passed away on June 21st, 2017 from kidney disease. It is believed that the stress of losing her daughter and not having answers contributed to her health issues. I hope that she has reunited with Lisa now and has her answers. Singer-songwriter from Nanaimo, Alison Crow, was a very good friend of Lisa's. They went to high school together. She has written Lisa's song as a tribute to Lisa's memory, which I'm going to play us out with at the end of this episode. It is a beautiful and very haunting song. 
Allison has made a successful career for herself, and in 2021, her version of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is on the soundtrack for the Justice League movie. She continues to make not just Lisa, but all of us Canadians very proud, and I am now a fan for life of all of her music. She now lives and works from Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. A Facebook group called Lisa Marie Young was created in 2008. It is currently administered by Cindy Hall, who is also a good friend of Lisa's. That page has become a huge advocacy group for Lisa with over 7,000 members and growing. They are warriors for Lisa, and I encourage you all to check it out. Cindy will never stop searching for Lisa and justice for her. The people that Lisa had as friends just amazes me. Their strength and courage and just the efforts that they have made and the personal risks that they have taken for their friend. The quality of the friends that Lisa has, I think, really speaks to her character of who Lisa was in life. JD is rumored to be in Turkey currently. As some of you might be aware, there was a terrible earthquake in Turkey in February of 2023. The Canadian Embassy is aware of 7,500 Canadians that were registered with them there. He was not one of the Canadians reported dead in that tragedy. Canadian consulars are working hard to get everyone back into Canada. I think that it would be amazing if he were one of them and he was once again on Canadian soil. The RCMP would be very open to any discussions with him. Someone out there knows what happened to Lisa Young and where her remains are, and I'm sure that the information you have been keeping has been eating you up inside, and it's time to release it. All we need is that missing piece of this puzzle, and if you have it, consider that if this was your sister, your niece, or your friend. Lisa didn't do anything to anyone. She deserves the peace of being found and laid to rest, and her family deserves some answers on what happened to their little girl. And that is the information that I have on the murder of Lisa Marie Young. If you happen to know any of the players in this case and have any information to provide, however small, please contact the Nanaimo RCMP detachment. And if you want further information on Lisa's case, please visit Island Crime Season 1 or join the Facebook group Lisa Marie Young. I will be back on Monday with a regular episode. Thank you so much for listening, and please stick around to listen to the entirety of Lisa's song by Alison Crow. You can find more of her music and information on tours at alisoncrowband.com, and that is Alison with two L's and Crow with an E. I want to be the one to say found you who safe and held you in my arms I want anyone else in the world to tell me that they did too took you home across the field and to your door and said hey There's no reason to be scared anymore Took you home, held you in Held you in, held you in
Across the sea into your door Take you home But I'm so scared That home isn't here anymore